getting into some good stuff, you guys. The, the good news is that everything is about to change when you encounter God. And uh, I want to talk to you guys about something that's, that's always on my heart is because I'm kind of, you know, the good news. You think, well, why is it good news? Well, because God wants us to have an abundant life. You know, I mean, it's just, what is the good news? I mean, well, God saved us from the pit of hell. Well, that's true. So is it just good news when we die? No, it's good news now because God wants us to have an abundant life. And so, I mean, if you think about, you know, for me, it's, it's what's the purpose of that? How do we grab a hold of that? And that's the good news. I mean, otherwise, once we get saved, why doesn't God just zap us home and bring us home? But he leaves us here, and he leaves us here for a purpose. And, and that's actually a good purpose, and it's an abundant life. But sometimes we get confused on, on how to have that abundant life. And it's because when we're raised, especially as we're raised outside of the church, um, you know, I, for, for me especially, I, I realized that at a very young age, I was looking for that hope and that peace and that joy. I wanted an abundant life. You, you know you don't have to be a believer to want hope and joy and peace. Every human being wants that. Um, it, it's, it's the key thing is, is that where are you finding that? You know, and I think so often in the world's sake or outside of Christ or even for those who are in Christ, I should say, we tend to want to find our hope and value in, in our successes. And making ourselves feel better. You know, one of the things that we do here in this culture is that those who have the most toys are the most successful. Or those who have the most in their bank accounts. Or those who have the most letters behind their name. Or those who've climbed their success in their area of field. You know, then they can sit back and say, wow, I've succeeded. I feel good about myself. Don't you feel good about yourself? You know, you've done something. Problem is that, that that just doesn't maintain. I mean, you shouldn't, it's not that those things are bad. I think it's good to, to uh, you know, make a good living. It's good. It's good to do your best. It's good to get an education. We're so blessed here. You should take advantage of the opportunities that we have here. Those are all good. But none of those are, are going to, none of those are going to bring us an abundant life. None of those are going to bring us the abundant life that Christ offered us. And there's, there's this like, see there's this thing that happens when Jesus came and he just turned everyone upside down. You know, I mean, he went to people and he went right to the heart of the matter and he said some crazy things. He said, you know what, if you truly wanna have life, you have to give up life. And they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, he says, if you wanna be part of me, you have to die to yourself. In fact, if you don't deny yourselves, he says in Mark 8 and 9, he says if you don't, and not just Mark 8, but also throughout the, all the Gospels, he says if you don't deny yourself and pick up your cross, you can have no part of me. And, and you just look and he says, well, what is he saying? And what he's really saying, what I want to talk about the good news, is that what Jesus is saying is that I want to, that more is less, but less is more. That's pretty cool, huh? More is less and less is more. And here's all it is, you guys. I'm, besides trying to be tricky with words. Um, it's simply the more you grab a hold of try to build yourself up in you, the less you're going to have of Christ. But the less you let go of yourself, the more you can get of Christ. Like I said, if I, if I wanted to you know, I've had a few sips of this, but if I wanted to fill this up with coffee, which would be a good substitute, by the way, um, if I wanted to fill this up with coffee, you know, uh, I would first need to empty it of the water. You see, there's not enough room in this, this little bottle for, for, for both, of, or, you know, and that's sometimes what we like to do. We like to, you know, have our own self, and then we give God this little thimble, this little cap, and say, fill it up with that. And what God is saying is, look, there's, you can't have it both ways. Jesus says the same thing in, in Matthew chapter 6. He says you can't serve two things. You can't serve both God and money. But what he's really saying is you can't serve both God and yourself. Because you want money because you think that that's going to bring you peace. But it's really not going to. Only I can bring you true abundant peace. But to do that, you have to have less of yourself and more of me. And so that's what I want to talk about today is how do we do that? John the Baptist in John chapter uh, 3 verse 30, he's 
sitting around with his disciples right as Jesus began his ministry. And in verse 26, his disciples come up to him and they say, hey, John. And you got to remember, John just baptized Jesus the day before. And they come up to him and they said, hey, John, do you see that guy over there you just baptized? Look at, he's starting to gain more followers than you. How do you feel about that, John? Now, I mean, in our world's eyes, we're like, Pfft dude, I'm going to show him, you know, you know, I mean, that's kind of how we're in that competitive mode, you know what I mean? But that's not what John says. John recognizes, he says, oh, it's my joy that he is increased. In fact, he says in verse 30, he must increase and I must decrease. And he's talking about Jesus because he recognized his purpose in calling life was to prepare the way for the Messiah. See, he had a purpose and a call, and he was seen it fulfilled in Jesus. You see, it's the same for us. When we see Jesus exalted, we ourselves is lift up. You guys ever wonder why we sit and we start off worshiping with God and singing him praise songs? Sometimes I, I don't want to interrupt the flow of the worship, you know, but I just want to get up and remind you guys sometimes who saying, I lift your name up high or I praise you. And I, do you guys know why we're doing it? It's not because God is insecure. Okay, God's not sitting up there and saying, do you guys still love me? You know, I mean, he says, do you really, come on, give me a pat on the back, guys. You know, it's not what he's doing. It's when we exalt him, he lifts us up. When we get ourselves, our eyes off of ourselves and onto him, we then see who we are in him. You see, and that's always greater than who we are in this world. And so when we're praising God, what we're doing is actually being blessed ourselves. And that's, that, that's just the, the, the odd thing about it. God says, praise me because he wants to bless you. And what he's saying is, look at me so you can see who you are in me, so you can glorify me, and as you glorify me, I will bless you. Jesus says that. He says, he who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted, i.e., less is more and more is less. The more you try to grab a hold and build yourself up, you're going to lose out on the gifts of God. But the more you humble yourself and let go of yourself, the more you can gain in Christ. Do you believe that? You see, sometimes we struggle with that because we don't believe that. If you, if you believe that, you're going to grab a hold of the truth and say, wait a second, I really want everything that God has for me because I believe what he has is better than this world. You guys hear me say it all the time, and I hope you guys can memorize it. God doesn't give you demotions, but what? Promotions. You aren't taking a back seat to someone. You're moving forward in Christ. But it's not easy. It's not just head knowledge. It's an encountering with God. So I, I, with that, starting on that page with more is less, and less is more, I wanted to talk about how do we practically do that? I just want to give you two practical handlebars because if theology isn't practical, it's, it's worthless. If you're not able to apply it to your life, then, then you're going to go out here and think, oh, well, that guy said something, he was funny or he was boring, whatever. But you know, I mean, you have to be able to apply it to your life. And so I want to just give you two practical ways that we can really apply less is more in Christ. So when we give ourselves, Christ raises us up and finds itself in him. The first one I want to talk about, Apostle Paul really demonstrated powerfully, and that is, is that you need to find your worth and identity in Christ. You know, we talked about this at the men's weekend constantly, and that was, if I had to say there was one theme at the men's weekend, it was your identity and your value in Christ. And, and that's one of the key things that we do. You see, in this world, we constantly want to place our value on what we can accomplish or what we haven't accomplished, either successes or failures. And the thing about what Jesus says is I want you to daily, if you want to grow more and have an abundant life in me, I want you to daily find your value in what I have done and created you in. One of the things that we've been talking about and we shared about was our children. And if you're a parent, you know you look at your kid and you are overwhelmed with love for your kid. Not because of something they did or they didn't do, right? but because simply who they are. 
The Apostle Paul, he gives this great litany of, of this list in Philippians chapter 3 about all his successes. He's a Hebrew, Hebrews meaning he wasn't a convert, you know, from the tribe of Benjamin. And, and you know, I mean, all these just great little lists of this, this like pedigree of who the Apostle Paul is. And then he says in verse, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, you know what? I count it all loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I just count it all loss. Meaning, it's not that those things are bad. It's not that he's saying that he's ashamed of being a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's not ashamed of his birth. He's not ashamed of his credentials. That's not what it is. It's just in perspective to what God is offering, because who he is in Christ, he's just keeping it in perspective. He's saying, look, it's not bad that I got educated. It's not bad that I've had all these things happen, these good things happen in my life. It's just in perspective, I count it all loss. Because I know what's more valuable. It's the same way with us. God wants us to have an abundant life. He wants me to cough too. <laughs> but it's not if we're going to find our identity and self-worth in our accomplishments, our successes, or even our failures. You know, the Apostle Paul, right after he said that in verse 8, he even said, look it, I don't even get worried about my failures. In fact, I forget what is behind me, and I strain towards what is ahead of me, in verse 12 and 14. He says, you know, I forget, and even his failures, and the Apostle Paul was a murderer, or an associate to murder anyways. And so he, had, he was part of killing the first martyr of Christianity in Acts 7. And so you see when he, you know, and so this was, Apostle Paul had some failures. He was persecuting the church. But he says, I forget what that is behind because who I am in Christ is of greater value. Do you know in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, you know, Jesus says to, his, says to the crowd, he says, look at all you who are tired and weary and burdened, burn out, and even I love the messages version. It says, if you're burnt out on religion, I want you to come to me for I am gentle and humble in heart. You guys know, I, have, I brought one out. I didn't bring it out today. I was too lazy to bring it down. But in my office, I have this big wooden oak. Uh, yoke, excuse me, not oak. It's made out of oak, maybe. But it's, it's a yoke. And, you know, it was, it's an old uh, tool that they use for oxen. And they would, they would hold it together. And what the, the metaphor is, is that when you are yoked to Jesus, is what he's saying, is you're part of him. You know, you're part of him. You are a child of God, an ambassador of Christ, beloved. We were focusing on Ephesians 1 uh, over the men's weekend, and we talked about being lavished of God's love. That's who you are in Christ. Isn't that awesome? It's that like God loves you. You're his child. If you have faith in Christ and you've believed in him, but holding on to that, Holding on to those truths is how you begin to become less of yourself and more of him. Okay, moving on. I want to give you one more. You find your value, but you also have to forfeit your rights. Finding your value in Christ and forfeiting your rights. You know, rights as, as Christians are one of the things that we have the hardest time giving up. And I think it's as an American Christian because we are so, I don't want to say, entitled here. Okay, as an Americans, we are so entitled, all, you know, I mean, uh, it's just in the sense that it's our, we fight for our freedom, okay, and that's not a bad thing. We value freedom here in this country, and that's a good thing, but with that, we think, hey, this is my right because I've died for this. Well, the funny thing is, is that it says in Galatians 2.20 that I no longer live, but the life I live in this body, I live for Christ. I.e., I've given up my rights because I've died to my old self that I can live in you. This is, what, this is the key concept. In Christ, we're called to actually give up our rights that we may be found in Christ. And Jesus modeled this. Jesus left heaven, so what? He left heaven, became a servant, so you could enter into heaven and be served. Jesus took on disgrace that you would experience his grace. Jesus bore the cross and the shame of the cross that you would not have to, that you could have life. He faced death so that you could have life. He humbled himself 
and became obedient unto death. In fact, let me read the passage. I don't have this one memorized verbatim, but it's uh, in Philippians chapter 2, and beginning in verse 5, it says, In your relationships with one another, you're having the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So this is the commandment that we have, is that we should follow the same mindset of Jesus. And then what he says, he said, Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. I mean, he didn't sit there and say, hey, you know what, I too am God. I'm going to exert my rights. No, he gave those up to serve others. And then he goes on, he says, Rather he made himself nothing by t- taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He became less. See, this was God took on the body of a servant and became less so that you could become more. What did God the Father do? Well, let's find out. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. To the glory of the Father. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. If you want more of an abundant life, one of the key steps is not only finding your value in Christ, but it's letting go of your rights of this life. You see, we are, let's just be honest here. I'll, let me share with me. I, you know, it, it, whenever I get in an argument or, or something, um, the first thing that says, oh man, they're stepping on my rights. You know, they're, 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 they're infringing on it and they're wrong. That's real important to me about being right, by the way. Ask my wife. You know, it's, uh, you know I'm like, they're wrong. You know, and, and, and what I've learned was is it doesn't matter. She's taught me well. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong, even if I'm right. Uh, <laughs> no, just, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. It matters that there's been a hurt there. It matters that there's hurt. And it matters that one person is, is in pain or has been wounded. That's what matters. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. So you give up your rights. You know, I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to give up my rights. I'm going to take the very nature of Christ and be humble and give up rights. And isn't it interesting that we often think of humility as not being a braggart? I think that it's important not to be a braggart. That's fine. But humility isn't sitting there saying, oh, you did such a good job. Oh, no, I didn't. I, I'm so poor. I suck. You know, you, know that's, you guys, that's false humility. Okay? I, I, I want to teach you guys something as Christians. If someone says, wow, you did a good job, here's what you say. Thank you. <laughs> I thought so. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. I, that's it. You know, you give God credit. Thank you so much. I needed the encouragement. Praise God. It was awesome. You know, that's, that's generally the healthy way to do Because it's not, it's false humility to say, oh, I'm so bad. No, God gifted you. God gave you a strength or a gift and stuff. You know, just praise him for it and say thank you. But what true humility is, true humility is being obedient and giving your life up for Christ and unto him. True humility is serving others in place of serving yourself. And when you do that, you die to yourself and you are reborn in Christ. Isn't that the way the very beginning of a rebirth in Jesus is? Isn't the very beginning of our relationship being born again, Jesus, please save me and be the Lord of my life? It's a surrendering of your life. It's humbling yourself. I can't save myself and I want you to be the Lord of my life. You guys, if you haven't done those two things, then according to Scripture, you're not saved. You need to recognize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you're a sinner. And then he, you're born again in him and you become a saint. And you need to make him Lord of your life. He's not just Savior, he's Lord. That's a part of being hum- humble. And that's the beginning of the transformation. That's the beginning where we become new in him, born again in him. Does that make sense? Think about and ask yourself right now, in what way is God asking you to forfeit your rights in your life so that you could grow more abundantly in him? Is there an area in your career goals maybe? And again, when I say this, I'm not sitting there saying, oh great, go quit your job or you need to quit your job. Maybe there's just something, an approach that you're wanting to take that God's wanting to tweak in your job. 
Maybe he wants you to say, oh, you know your coworker who you've been kind of arguing with? I want you to go and love them and surrender your rights. You know that person who's been stealing your lunch every day in the fridge? I want you to make two lunches for him. You know, you know that person who keeps on taking credit? I want you to give them credit. See, that's what I'm talking about. Those little things in your life. You know your spouse who's been just doing X, Y, and Z? I want you to go and love them even more. You see, this is, this is giving up your rights. This is what God is calling us to do. And as we do that, we are raised up in Christ and we are, get the mind of Christ and we are, receive actually more of abundant life because as we humble ourselves, he exalts us. And as we exalt ourselves, we get humbled. And it is more is less and less is more. Does that make sense, you guys? Awesome. I just want to close with this. I can't remember if I said I was going to close with the last one, but anyways, you get an extra goodie here. Uh, this is a bonus. Uh, there's one last thing that I want you guys to, to remember. In Matthew 11, in, in John chapter 3, you see the first part where John the Baptist tells his disciples, he must increase and I must decrease, meaning I must become less so that he could become more, and within me, him, I'll also become more. Uh, but also, later on in Matthew 11, right towards the end of Jesus' life, towards John's life, he's sitting in prison because Herod put him in prison, and he starts to think, and this would be, I would have been way before, when I even got arrested, I would have been doing this. But he's been in prison, and he's getting ready to be executed, and he, somehow he gets word to Jesus, hey, did I make a mistake? Are you the one? It's like, dude, you know, I can only imagine what he's thinking. He's just sitting there saying, oh, man, this is going to be it. I sure hope I put my confidence in the right guy, you know. And, and this is what Jesus says. Go back and tell John, the deaf can hear, the blind can see, the sick are healed, the lame can walk. I.e., go back and tell him what I have done. You guys... If you're doubting of surrendering and forfeiting your rights and finding your value in Christ more than the things of this world, look at what God has done and now ask yourself, can you do better than that? Can you do better than that? See, when you're doubting in the dark, remember what God did in the light. Don't forget in the dark what God did in the light. We are all gonna face those times where we're sitting there saying, is this really it? I mean, I'm about to give this up. Is this really worth it? Is this a smart move? Maybe. If God's calling you to do it, it is. Because he won't lead you down the wrong direction. He's faithful. Even when we're faithless, he is faithful. And he'll take care of you. I promise you, you're never going to get to heaven and say, oh man, I shouldn't have been generous at that time. Oh man, I wish I had fought for more of my rights there. Oh, man, I wish I hadn't, you know, been obedient to God at that point. It's never going to happen. John the Baptist died. Let's be real. He died. Jesus came back and said, yep, I'm the one. Look at all I'm doing. And whoosh, next day, man, it was done. But where did he go? Was it the end? No, he remembered and he understood. And it was scary, I'm sure. I would have been really scared. He, he understood that. This life is just a breath. This is not it. You are on a mission strip. This life is it. And so when Jesus says the abundant life, it's going to start now, but it doesn't end in this life. John the Baptist, he's in heaven with a new body. So that's it. I'm gonna, uh, today I thought, what a better way to close the day than celebrating communion with this message. Because this communion, I think, it's all about less is more. We take the bread because it's the body of Christ. We find our strength, our sustenance, not in ourselves, but in the body of Christ. We take the little vat of grape juice, symbolic of the blood of Christ. We find not our righteousness, not our own, but in the blood of Christ. And so when we do this, what we're proclaiming is that through Christ, I can become more as I give up less of me. I'm no longer going to seek to find my own righteousness in my own self. I'm going to lay that down, my self-righteousness, and I'm going to find it in the blood of Christ. I'm no longer going to try to provide on my own and be my own. That doesn't mean I go out and work, but I'm not going to trust in that. I'm going to trust in God, and I'm going to find my sustenance, my provision in the Lord. That's what it is.